provided protection, helped the soil to retain moisture, which in turn would help other plant communities. They helped change the landscape. Their influence didn't stop on land. Archaeopteris grew along the lake shores and helped change this environment too. Archaeopteris shed their branches, which then fell into the water, would eventually become waterlogged and sink to the lake floor. They would decay their nutrients would be leached out into the lake waters so that the trees provided both food and shelter for the fish. The fossil record shows that our distant ancestors moved into lake environments at around the same time as the predators. There were still challenges, but one of them would help life to make the next great step on the miracle planet. In the world today, mountains still play their part in shaping the land, as well as the life that lives on it. In South America, the Amazon rainforest needs the waters that run off the mountains after rain. The deluges of the wet season spread out through the rainforest, one of the richest ecosystems on Earth. When the forest is flooded, it provides nutrients and shelter for an amazing diversity of fish life. The armored pleco looks almost prehistoric, while the predatory arowana glides through the sunken forest. So frequent is the flooding that the trees have also adapted to spending much of their lives inundated. They provide both food and shelter to help sustain the rich variety of life. The muddy waters of the Amazon and other rainforest rivers perhaps can give us a glimpse of what life might have been like when it adapted to fresh water. The Amazon does not remain flooded all through the year. After the wet season, the sun begins to wield its power. By June, the waters dry up and can drop in some places by as much as 18 meters, almost 60 feet. And when it does drop, there are winners and losers. As the water becomes hot, there is little oxygen for the fish, so they flounder on the surface desperately trying to take gulps of air. But there is none to be had, so they die to become food for the scavengers. Yet around them, oxygen is everywhere. Scientists believe that 370 million years ago, the world would have experienced similar shifts in the annual climate. And yet again, the trees played their part. While their fallen branches gave shelter, the bacteria contributing to this breakdown consumed oxygen thus depleting the levels in the water. Today in the Amazon and elsewhere, there are fish that can handle this. The lungfish, relics from the past that are able to take oxygen as normal fish do from the water but they can also breathe air. And when the Amazon dries up, this fish will survive. 
often buried in wet mud, breathing as we do, with lungs. Recent research shows that lungfish are close relatives to our distant ancestors who lived in the shallows when the first forests took root on land. Dr. Per Alberg has studied Euthanopteron, and he believes that our distant ancestor had lungs like the lungfish of today. The lungfish is moved into a freshwater swamp environment at the same time as the earliest tetrapods and right alongside them. We find them together in the same strata. So when we look at modern day lungfishes and how their respiration works, what we're looking at is probably something that's closely convergent onto early tetrapods. Lungs evolved in all likelihood to help the animal to breathe when living in warm, tropical waters with a low oxygen content. This is the way science believes early fish developed lungs. First, the upper part of the esophagus, the airway, swelled and formed the precursor of a lung. Moving from the sea into the fresh water made this become larger. The inner surface was covered with capillary vessels to absorb more oxygen, which was essential for survival in those early lakes. If lungs had not been present in our ancestors, there is no way that our ancestors, ancestors would have made it to become truly competent terrestrial animals. We would still be flopping around in the shallows today. Modern fish are the descendants of those early lungfish. But the lung of the modern fish is no longer used for breathing. Instead, it has evolved into an air bladder, which helps it keep its equilibrium when it changes depth in the water. Most of the ancient fish that stayed in the ocean did not develop lungs, so they eventually became extinct. But to step on land, you need to be able to walk as well as breathe. And that was the next challenge to be met on the Miracle Planet. Muddy streams are as good as anywhere to look for the evidence of those first creatures which began to make the move from water to land. Dr. Jennifer Clack from Cambridge University in England made a remarkable find in East Greenland. The fossil in this rock has been dated at 360 million years, and it belongs to an early tetrapod, creatures which developed limbs. Even more remarkable, it clearly has fingers. It's the first record of any animal with a hand and fingers. The creature is called Ancanthostega, and from the fossil, Dr. Clack has made detailed sketches of what she and other experts think the animal looked like. The tail appears to be made up from fins, more characteristic of a fish than a reptile. Looks like a fish, except it has limbs rather than fins. But its skull was stronger than the skull of a fish, and she believes it was able to move its neck. It evolved from fish that made their way into the fresh water and could breathe air when they had to for survival. But where the earlier fish had fins, it developed limbs. It was a strange creature, about a meter or three feet long. A 
Until now, the fossil evidence had only ever revealed creatures with five fingers. It had eight. That was extraordinary, because previous to that, it had always been assumed that five digits was the primitive number, and you couldn't have more than five. So that really got us thinking about the origin of limbs, and it put a new spin on the whole story of where limbs came from and how they developed. Not much longer than here, but you've got that big sort of fleshy body around, mm -hmm. full of muscles that, that move. To start with, she believed that the limbs had obviously evolved for it to walk on land. Detailed analysis of the skeleton ruled out that possibility. From the way that the limbs were joined to the body, they would not have been able to carry weight out of the water. Which is much longer than the ulna there. You don't find that anywhere about them again, not all, so... Mystery. But they, they certainly go back in uh, evolution to Houston Optron and, and things like that, because they'd had them. Um, they go back right to the beginning. The humerus and the radius and ulna are fixed at an angle that wouldn't allow the, the limb to, to bend like that. The, the articulations here and here suggest that the arm is, is carried sideways and that there's no weight-bearing function. They performed detailed skeletal analysis and then made a computer model of the creature. But this produced even more questions. The animal was able to wriggle its way forward through the water, almost as if it was swimming. But it would have been very slow without fins. So why hands with fingers? A possible answer came once again from Red Hill, the site of the first known forest. Here is also evidence of rich and varied life in a freshwater lake. Dr. Ted Deschler from the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia has been working here. Fin spine of an acanthodian fish and made for a rigid pectoral fin. Yeah. Amongst other fossils, he has found one which gives a hint to the development of these fingers. It's a large tooth. This is a single tooth of Hyneria. The other tetrapods, such as Acanthostega and Ichthyostega and a few others from around the world, also lived in these freshwater environments in the late Devonian, along with predators like Hyneria. And that may have been part of the pressure which made the early tetrapods specialize in shallow water using their early rudimentary limbs to get into shallow water and swamps to escape predation. Hyneria would have been a ferocious hunter. Fossils indicate that it was covered with hard scales like armor and was a fast swimming predator, something to hide from. Hyneria would have been the most ferocious fish in the ecosystems at Red Hill. The body form in Hyneria is clearly an animal that was able to swim very quickly, start fast, chase its prey, grab its prey with huge teeth. On the contrary, the earliest limbed animals do not seem like they had the same kind of body plan to escape. So our ancestors in Hyneria was not a fair match. When the early fish moved into 